Today we're going to get started with lab three. The focus of lab three is on age structured populations. Ideally, you will have already read chapter three in the Gatelli book and reviewed the materials on the web page about age structured populations. That'll give the basic theory behind why we often model populations in a way that we explicitly model how vital rates like birth rate and death rate change as a individual's age in the population. Because in many populations, the uh, change in vital rates can be quite dramatic from one age to the other. Maybe juveniles have a very high mortality rate and adults have a very low mortality rate. Or juveniles have zero birth rate but potentially have a very high birth rate as adults. And so we need to consider how these vital rates change with age in order to accurately model how these populations work. So please review Gatelli chapter three and the a web page on age structured populations before getting started with this lab. All right, so here we're going to be able to start adding complexity to our population models. We've talked about basic exponential growth and we've talked about density dependence, but in all cases we've considered a single n, that is, that n meaning the population is just a single number. Here, instead of thinking of it as a single number, we think of a population as consisting of individuals of several different ages. And so we're now considering age as a dimension in our model, and we have to start thinking about how things like survival and mortality rate change with age. All right, so I will say at the outset that this is one of the more difficult parts of this class. I know people can struggle with life tables, for instance. I think you may have had a chance to work with life tables a little bit in Dr. Stewart's wildlife ecology and management class, but um, it can be a very difficult uh, top topic. It can involve some, some pretty uh, complex computations. And so we're gonna go over that in some, well, hopefully go over it fairly slowly and hopefully it will make sense to you and it'll make even more sense as we go through the lab. But I do uh, know that this can be a difficult topic for many of you. So what we're gonna do first is to go through uh, the mathematics, yay, of age structured populations. In lab four, we'll, we'll also talk about age structured populations, but that's where we'll start to get into matrix population modeling. That may sound uh, daunting, but don't worry about it right now. We're not gonna get uh, to that until um, next week in class and two weeks from now in lab. All right, um, so let's talk about some definitions first. Um, so this lab is primarily dealing with life tables. We'll also do an insight maker. Um, age structured population model so you can get familiar with how to model age structured populations in Insight Maker which hopefully will get you started thinking about uh, your final projects as well because many of you will be uh, building age structured population models um, in your final projects. So let's get uh, first talk about the terminology of life tables. Life tables are probably the most basic representation of age structured populations. Life tables have been around for many, many decades and uh, started uh, really in the actuarial science that is of uh, studying human uh, life tables for in life insurance purposes. That's kind of how life tables got started. But we use life tables as well just to uh, investigate uh, wild populations and how population rates change uh, with age. So let's get started. Uh, we first have to understand what the definition of a cohort is. A cohort is a group of organisms of the same species that are born during the same year or during the same breeding season. So it's a group that were born at around the same time. And if we follow that cohort through time, we can uh, determine when they gave birth, we can determine when they died, and if we can track them long enough, we can track them until the very last member of that cohort 
is no longer alive. That is what a life table essentially represents. It's essentially tracking a single cohort over its entire lifetime. And so we have to know what a cohort is before we really understand what a life table is. So make sure you know the definition of a cohort that will appear in an upcoming exam for sure. The next term is X. X just represents age. In a life table, we start off at age zero. That is birth, the time of birth. And one represents exactly one year of age. Two represents two years of age, so on and so forth. Um, it doesn't have to be years, but most often it is measured in years. So X will represent age. Capital S, capital S um, parenthesis X, meaning it is referring to the number of survivors after X years. So by definition, S at time zero is the total size of the cohort. That's every individual that was born at the same time. Um, so that's the total number in the cohort. S parenthesis zero, S sub zero is the total number of the cohort. S parenthesis one is the total number of survivors, the total number of the cohort that survived to age one. S parenthesis two is the total number of uh, individuals in the cohort that survive to age two, and so on and so forth. So that is the, that's what we mean by capital S parenthesis X. Similarly, capital D parenthesis X is just the total number of deaths. Um, so that is the number of age X individuals who die before reaching age X plus one. So D parenthesis zero represents the total number of individuals that die before they reach age one. And D uh, parenthesis one is the total number of individuals that die before they reach age two. All right, next, this should look familiar. Little b represents the per capita birth rate. All right, that's the average number of offspring produced by an individual, but this time, we have parenthesis X to represent age. So B parenthesis X represents the per capita birth rate for individuals that are basically at age X. So you'd expect that birth rate at age zero should probably be in most cases zero. But at some point, individuals will mature and will be able to give birth at some per capita rate. Um, this is probably a good time to just remind, if uh, just a, a quick reminder that when we're talking about wild populations, we're often really thinking about just the females because the females are the ones that contribute offspring and really make the, the population grow. So we often don't really think about males because males are really <laughs> not as important as females when it comes to population growth. Males, if there's sufficient number of males, now most populations are not monogamous, so if there's just a few males in the population, pretty much all the females should be able to be uh, fertilized and be able to be reproductive. And so we often don't even think about males. So when we're thinking about life tables, this is often really a female-only um, representation of the population. We're only thinking about females, all right? This is a way we simplify population models, and in many cases, the models you'll see published in the literature are actually female-only models. They'll say that in, the, in their methods, that they're only considering females, and that's a widely um, accepted practice in population ecology to just focus on the females only, um, and there are good reasons for that. So that's just an aside, but a good thing to note at this point, when we're talking about birth rates, um, it makes more sense to think that all the individuals that we're thinking about here are females. All right, so B sub X, uh, little b sub X, is the average number of offspring produced by an individual in age category X, in age X. 
Um, and this is sometimes in some life tables called maternity or M parenthesis X. Um, so little b uh, parenthesis five might be say 1.5 or something. Then average, on average, every five-year-old individual gives birth to 1.5 offspring, female offspring, I should say, if we're, if we're looking at a female only model. So that's birth rate. Next we have survivorship. This is a, this is a new concept here because this is not the same thing as survival rate. You'll see survival rate is down here. So that's a separate concept. Survivorship is not the same thing as survival rate. What, what survivorship means is the fraction of the cohort that survives to age X, right? So to do that, to, to compute, or so here it is, the, the fraction of the cohort that is expected to survive to a given age X, um, to compute that, we take the number of survivors that made it to age X and divide it by the original size of the cohort, S sub zero, uh, big S sub zero, and that gives us survivorship, all right? So that's an important concept, and we'll go over that too in the lecture page on age structured populations. Next, let's think about survival rate. Now, this is more similar to the survival rate that we've already talked about in this class. And this is computed by taking the total number of survivors to age X plus one, dividing it by the total number of individuals that started off alive at age X. And so that gives us the probability of survival from age X to the subsequent year, X plus one. All right, that's survival rate, and it is distinct from survivorship, which is the fraction of the entire original cohort that makes it to a given age x. All right, so that is survival rate. And then we can start to get to some slightly more complex but very important population parameters that we can derive from the life table, from these parameters we've already looked at, like survivorship, L sub X, and per capita birth rate, B sub X. One of these derived parameters is called R sub zero, or the lifetime reproductive potential of the population. All right, so R sub zero is the lifetime reproductive potential, and this is a number that's computed from the life table, but it's just a single number, all right? And lifetime reproductive potential represents the average number of female offspring produced per female over her entire lifetime. This is a really important parameter because it starts to get at the idea of replacement. How many females <laughs> per female uh, do you need in order to have a replacement, in order for a female to replace herself essentially in the population at throughout her lifetime? That is, if the population is growing, females ha will have to be at least replacing themselves, right? So if the lifetime potential, reproductive potential, R sub zero, is less than one, females are not able to replace themselves. If it's greater than one, females are able to replace themselves in the population, all right? And so reproductive potential is computed as the sum across all the age classes, or the, all the ages, K being the very uh, maximum age where um, there are no individuals left in the cohort, essentially, the maximum possible age. Um, so we sum across all possible ages, um, and we take the product of the survivorship at each age and the birth rate, uh, the per capita birth rate at each age. We sum up, so we take the product of the survivorship and the birth rate for every age in the po every possible age um, in the cohort, and we sum up all that, all those products. So we, all these terms here, we sum them up across all ages, and that is relatively easy to compute in Excel, as we're gonna show you um, very shortly. 
And um, it's a really important population parameter because it tells you if females can replace themselves. And it, the larger this number is, the greater it is over um, replacement or one, then the faster the exponential growth is in this population. And if it's below one, and the, the farther it is below one, um, the, the more rapid the decline. Now the idea of lifetime reproductive potential as for the other um, derived terms that we're going to that we're going to derive from these life tables are going to be hopefully um, more understandable once we go through it in Excel as well. You'll see how to compute it and hopefully it'll make sense what it means but it's um, good to kind of go over it first just what we're this is what we're going to do in Excel we will go over these things again as we go through them more explicitly in Excel so um, the other another term uh, derived term that we're going to be um, computing from the life table is the total life expectancy again this is uh, just a single number that we can compute for our, uh, from the information that's in the life table and this might look fairly complicated, but it's again relatively straightforward to compute in Excel. This is an approximation of life expectancy, and uh, this term life expectancy, incidentally, can be computed for every age in the population. So we could compute the life expectancy of all one-year-olds in the population and the life expectancy of all two-year-olds. But oftentimes what we really want to know is the life expectancy at birth, which is LE life expectancy sub zero for age zero or at birth. And we can compute that by taking the sum, again, across all possible ages from the birth to the maximum possible age, um, K being the maximum possible age. We add up the number of years of life essentially in the population and divide it by the total number of individuals in the cohort. So, um, Maybe this uh, makes sense, maybe it doesn't right now, but um, you take the total number of, of survivors, basically, that made it to the next year of life. So starting at birth, you take the total number of individuals that made it one year of life, and then you assume here, and this is where this is an, a real, this is an approximation of life expectancy, because to really get this uh, more accurate takes more complex calculations that we don't need to get into in this class. But we can assume here that all individuals that died at least lived half the year. That's a, that's a gross approximation, Made it, may make sense for some uh, species more than others, but it allows us to get a reasonable approximation of, of life expectancy for many species. So um, th that's what we're doing here. We're taking half the number that didn't make it basically to the next age class, that, that big D sub X. Uh, and we're multiplying it by 0.5 to assume that basically each one of those individuals lived half a year, all right? And then you just sum all that up, um, all those years of life lived by the cohort and divided by the total number in the cohort to get the average life expectancy for every individual in the cohort. So that's life expectancy. We'll go over that in Excel as well. Again, not too hard to compute in Excel. Um, all right, so generation time, we're starting to get a little bit more complex now. Is the, and generation time is not the easiest concept. It, it's something we throw around all the time. We talk about generation time and um, you know what that means is actually a little bit, a little bit convoluted, a little bit difficult. And there's actually several definitions of generation time floating out around out there. So we're going to define it in this class as the average age of the parents within a cohort. That is the average age um, of the parents for all offspring born to the cohort. Um, and so we can imagine um, for every offspring born to the cohort, that is, we, uh, every time an individual offspring is born to a member of our cohort that we're following, we record the age of the mom when she gave birth. And then we keep recording all the ages of all the moms at when they gave birth. And we take the average age of the moms. 
that is generation time. All right, it's a little bit, a little bit difficult to understand. I hope that makes some sense. The average age of the parents within the cohort. If you know the average age of the parent, that kind of gives you an idea of the time between birth and reproduction. All right, and that's what we kind of mean by a generation time. All right, so hopefully that makes some sense. We'll go over that in uh, Excel, but this is how we compute it. We call it big G, generation time. And uh, again, the, the, this isn't too difficult to compute in Excel, but it looks a little um, daunting, perhaps. We take the sum from age zero all the way to the maximum age from birth till um, the maximum age. And we take L sub X, the survivorship, times the per capita birth rate at that age, times the age itself. And we sum that quantity up across across all ages, and we divide that by the sum across all ages of the survivorship times the birth rate. And this quantity here might look somewhat familiar. That looks a little bit like the lifetime reproductive potential. Um, all right, that is generation time. We're almost there in terms of the, the different definitions of the things we're gonna be uh, working with and talking about in our life table um, exploration. Intrinsic rate of growth, we've seen this before. This is uh, the intrinsic rate of growth of the population. That's the exponential rate of growth of the population. Um, and we can actually derive little r, or the intrinsic rate of growth, from things we've already computed here in this, or we've talked about, and we will compute in Excel. Um, we can compute little r as the natural logarithm of the lifetime reproductive potential divided by the generation time. And that's a good approximation. It's not, again, it's approximation. It's not the be all and end all. It's not the, the absolute r, but it's good enough for this class. Um, in Gatelli, in the Gatelli book, chapter three, you can read about a more accurate method for estimating R from a life table, but again, not something we need to do in this class, but it's called the Euler method, Euler spelled E-U-L-E-R, and that is something you can look into, but it's not something we're gonna be testing you on in this class. All right, um, one more concept to go over before we get into Excel, and that here is the concept of reproductive value often called big V, capital V, um, parenthesis X, or sub X, reproductive value. This is the uh, expected future reproductive output of any individual of age X. So you take an individual, say age two in the population, and we can compute the reproductive value representing the expected future reproductive out output of an individual of that age. and the reproductive value is often adjusted for the intrinsic rate of growth. And that is an interesting concept that um, would, I encourage you to think about why we're adjusting this for the intrinsic rate of growth. But first of all, let me show you the, the equation which we will go over in Excel. This is the most difficult of the equations that we're gonna be implementing in this lab. Reproductive value is computed as the base of the natural logarithm to, uh, the, uh, to Rx, and this should look familiar. This numerator should look familiar just because that should look like the basic equation of exponential growth where you take the initial population size and zero multiply it by e to the r times t to get the total uh, expected population size at time t. Here we have x being basically time in a as age. And so this uh, has a similar meaning. It's just reflecting the, the expected um, growth of the population at the time uh, that the cohort has reached age x. Um, Lx just represents the survivorship at age, uh, this, uh, the survivorship to age x. 
Um, and uh, then you take, take the, the sum from all ages greater than the age you're considering. That is, you're considering age X, so you take uh, the sum across all the older age classes all the way to the maximum age class, and you take the quantity uh, E to the minus R Y times the survivorship times the birth rate. And Y now represents all ages greater than the age you're considering here. Now that may not have made complete sense, and that's okay. This is a complex concept. This is not one that um, you can just, you're expected to look at this equation and know everything about it. But what's important here is that you understand the concept of reproductive value as the expected future reproductive output of an individual of a specific age adjusted for the rate of population growth. And when it says adjusted for the uh, intrinsic rate of growth, what it means is that if the population is growing, the value of an individual many years in the future is maybe less than it would be if the population was declining. If the population is declining, the value of that individual in the future is actually much greater because that individual will represent a, a larger proportion of the, the entire population. If the population is growing, that individual, if many years in the future, uh, if it's expected to produce offspring many years in the future, it's not that valuable because the population will be so huge because it's growing exponentially that that individual represents only a tiny, tiny proportion of the population. And so we adjust for the intrinsic rate of growth in order to, to make this, this uh, uh, quantity, reproductive value, and um, that's kind of why we have these, these extra complex um, terms like this, this term here, this e to the rx here, and this e to the minus ry here. That's why those terms are there for this adjustment for the intrinsic rate of growth. Um, but most important just is that you understand what this concept means and why it's important for wildlife management and wildlife conservation. If you're, for example, if you are uh, translocating individuals um, or uh, you have a captive breeding population and you want to um, move those individuals into a wild population um, and start a new population, you might want to start the population with individuals with the highest reproductive value, that is the highest expected um reproductive output essentially and so that is an important concept for conservation and it's also an important concept for evolutionary biology and life history theory so it's a very uh, useful concept to know and uh, one that we will delve into in a little bit more detail in this lab so that is all <laughs> the different uh, life table terms that we want to go over and that we're going to be uh, working with in this lab. So the next thing I'd like to do is to walk through a demo in Excel um, to go to compute all these different terms and then I will set you off on your own um, to complete this lab.